And good morning. Welcome to Inside Leather History, a fireside chat at uh, GLLA. It is August 23rd, 2014, and it's just after 9 a.m. We'd like to thank Miss Kendra for such an early hour. But my name is Doug O'Keefe. I am a co-producer and host of the chats. These chats are a program of the Leather Archives and Museum. They are co-produced by Christina Court and Mistress Joanne Gaddy. Today I have the distinction of being able to interview an amazingly interesting lady here at GLLA. I'd like to introduce my guest, Slade Caroline. Thank you for that charming introduction, Doug. You are most welcome. Let's go ahead and we'll just start right at the very beginning. Um, many people don't know that you were born in East Africa, but growing up you were aware of multiple inequities. How did seeing those inequities shape who you are today? That is true. Most people do not know that. I was born in Ethiopia, as were my parents, and that I identify as a white African. I don't talk about that much um, because there's, um, you know, when you, when you grow up in, in that kind of culture, and you live the life of a privileged white person, it's so far beyond the norms um, that most people have lived. It's hard to kind of relate to, so I don't generally talk about that, but I had servants. I was, you know, ordering around my maid at the age of three. Um, we had a very, very privileged life because if you're white in Africa, um, you, you just basically are very privileged. Um, I had friends who were children of African dignitaries, um, European diplomats. We lived in a truly multicultural kind of society in which, you know, Hindus, Muslims, Christians um, celebrated, respected each other's rituals and differences. Um, so I grew up in a very rich culture, but it's also true that I've also witnessed incredible, unimaginable inequities. I mean, I've, I grew up seeing lepers in the street, in poverty that you can't imagine. Um, public hangings, which you and I talked about um, a while back. And this is not the kind of realm of most everyday average people's experience in the West. But I have to say that it has truly shaped who I am. How did that shape you? What psychological issues came into play with that? Well, I think fundamentally being so privileged, you realize there but for the grace of God go I. And it really um, established for me the sense of justice and injustice in the world. That being profoundly lucky, that I have a kind of a, a social obligation to give back to the world. Um, many of my peers were not like that. They, they became, and still are, very hedonistic. But to me it was about how do you rebalance that? But I guess there were several other things more profoundly if I think about it. It's that living in Africa, you become very aware that human life is very cheap that survival at its most primal is what life is about. And I just became um, very conscious about the difference between what is real and what is not real. What is, how can I say it? Um, a profound difference about what suffering is and what it isn't. 
So, you know, when people complain about being victims of this, that, or the other, and you kind of relate that to what real survival is about, it kind of balances that out. But I guess more profoundly, even more so than that, having grown up as a white person in Ethiopia, I think I developed a very early sense of the impact of power. And so I think my interest in, my being with, um, my understanding of power and power imbalance is deeply rooted in that experience. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that? Well, I guess more profoundly that there is a huge ethical responsibility with having power. That power can be easily misused and abused, but that coupled with Morality, ethics, social justice, power can also be a source of good, but it requires those things. And I grew up being very, I guess, comfortable is not the word, because it's not a matter of comfort, but aware that life and people and interrelationship is rooted in dominance and submission. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. But that's also because I'm a precautious kind of child. You know, I think a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure other people don't think that way. <laughs> why, do, why is that? Why were you precocious as a child? I have one very profound gift. And it's an ability to think. And it's a gift and it's a curse. So because I was a very thoughtful child and perceptive, um, I think I was very precocious. <laughs> Difficult as a child for my parents. How so? I asked How were you why a lot. Uh... More so than your average kid, but you know, why? Why? Tell me why. I don't understand. And I read a lot. Fascinating. Absolutely. That fascinating. also translates into being a difficult slave. <laughs> <laughs> but when and how did you know you were kinky? From, from, from forever. So how did you begin to understand that or explore it? Well, Doug, you know, as a child, you don't have a kind of a, a construct with language associated with it. I remember my father had a very extensive library, and I read a lot. So I remember finding this book of um, drawings, ink drawings, black ink. And it was a book on the uh, Inquisition. Now, I, I swear to God, I was so turned on. I didn't actually have the language for what it was, but I was so turned on. I would steal this book, <laughs> take it into my bedroom, and use a flashlight to kind of go over these horrendous pictures of torture. But they were exciting. They were hot. In hindsight, I know what it was. It was arousing. But I knew, I, and here's the thing, the surreptitious behavior was, was an indication that I knew this is not normal. This is not, this is sick. And, you know, to be honest, it wasn't until um, I was about 12 um, when I read the story about, and that gave me language around 
Oh, so this is what I'm experiencing. Fascinating. So what drew you to the MS scene and, and thus to the United States? I was involved in kinky activities from a very young age um, in BDSM. And I met when the internet kind of took over, like I'm pre-internet, but when the internet took over, I met a master um, online who, because I traveled a lot, I ended up um, meeting fairly soon after we met online in New York. He's an American. And I became a slave. It was a complicated relationship because he was a complicated man. And I still have a very good relationship with him. But I became a secret slave because he was married in a vanilla relationship and had another woman who was a submissive who did not um, want him to have another. It was a difficult... Um, dynamic. Anyway, long story short, he, after seven and a half years, he abandoned me. That happens. We know that happens. Um, but I was devastated. I remember we were here. Um, he met me in Annapolis. I got on the plane to go back to Australia. <clears throat> there is no master-slave community in Australia, so I had no support, no understanding. Long story short, again, I ended up coming to my first, um, <clears throat> excuse me, my first master-slave um, conference, 2004, at um, North East, region. Okay. The one in DC. Yes. Okay. So it was a function of alienation, isolation, a sense of needing community that brought me here and healing. And at that conference, interestingly, I met pretty much most of the people who I consider to be my leather family. Wonderful. Master Jim, Slade Marsha, Master Z and his family. Mm -hmm. He had just recently won the title. Master, Slip, Master Skip, Master Bert. Um, these people became my family of choice. That's what brought me here. And then, Slave Robert, who was um, Master Steve's heterosexual slave at the time, created Slave Caroline. He invited me that year to go to Southwest Leather and do a presentation. Wow. What presentation did you do? The first, <clears throat> the first presentation I gave in this country um, was about spirituality and MS. Fascinating. Let's build on that a little bit. A few years ago here at GLLA, I had the privilege of hearing your keynote address. What motivates you when you're preparing something like that, a speech like that, or a presentation like that? Primarily what comes from the heart what I feel needs to be spoken. Um, I also ask the people who are inviting me to speak and get a sense of who their audience is, what is it that they believe their audience wants to hear, and um, where are they at, what you know, over the years, since 2004, I've observed a lot of changes 
in the MS community in terms of what people are interested in and so on. But yeah, um, in the, especially in the initial days, I'd ask a lot more, what do you need? What does your community need? Because across America, different regions are really have different flavors and different needs. What are some of those needs? Well, across the board, MS, which is what I talk about more than SM, um, MS is mostly about relationships and dynamics and so on. But the levels of involvement with spirituality, let's say, versus um, pure dynamics versus community building are very different across regions. For example, I mean, this uh, GLLA is one of my favorite places to come to because Ms. Kendra is such a remarkable community builder. And what you see here is a, is a melding, a meshing of different subgroups in our pinky community coming together, not necessarily playing in the dungeon together, but celebrating what is common. That's not as common in other places. And I've also seen an increasing number of heterosexualism. I don't mean that in a negative way. But with the advent of the internet, people have moved into visiting these events. Whereas 2003, 2004, a lot of these events were so much more mixed with a lot more of the gay men and gay women, you know, rubbing shoulders with heterosexuals and a, and a different kind of exploration about differences as well as similarities. Mm -hmm. Let's take one step back. We briefly talked about your time in Ethiopia and we've talked briefly about what brought you to the US, but we've missed a step. What took you to Australia? Um, my father. <laughs> um, <clears throat> my father was a very smart man. He knew that being a white person in Africa was a kind of a tenuous game. And he wanted his children to grow up without um, encumbrances, educationally and so on. We're also Armenian, and so we live with the legacy of persecution. So he's super sensitive to being persecuted and being a minority white group in, um, in Ethiopia. Even though highly respected, he knew once the emperor died, the politics in the country would change, and he wanted to be ahead of the game. And he actually first off wanted to come to live in America, and we actually lived in San Francisco for a year. But he got um, anxious because he couldn't get a green card, and we had papers for immigration to Australia. And I remember getting on the plane a day before those papers last, and arriving in Australia the day those papers were due. Fascinating. What motivates you or drives you as a slave? Well, Douglas, all slaves are driven by a slave heart and service, right? Yes. So I could say the same. Um, but the word service means different things to different people. And to me, whether I've, I'm in a college relationship or not, I've come to learn and understand that what drives me, the purpose, the telos of my life is to be of service. 
and to be of service in a way that makes a difference in the world. So, I, first of all, I don't think of myself as a slave in an occasional sense, because that is my being, and that permeates my work, my relationships, my family, my being in the world. Um, I'm not American, obviously. Um, I have more of the Australian characteristics of being a person in the world. Um, Americans tend to be very nice, generally. Don't give me that look. Okay. <laughs> Australians are much more brash and confrontational. And forthright, we have a you know a tradition of as coming from you know traditionally convict stock, mm -hmm. anti-authoritarian, confrontational, and forthrightness. So I tend to be a slave that sees where there are problems, and I don't shy away from challenging what needs to be challenged, what needs to be changed. And I see that as a deep service, a very deep service to society. Can you give me an example of when you've done that? Do you really want to know? I do, and I think the audience does too. I think from a master-slave perspective, when I see relationships that are incredibly dysfunctional. And I don't insert myself without being asked, but if I'm invited to comment or invited to um, intervene, I hold, I don't hold back. I'm very, very clear about this is wrong. I have no fear of masters. I don't I'm not afraid that people are going to define me because I know who I am. And that makes, I've been told by some masters that I'm scary. And I think that's partly what it is because I do know who I am. And I know that what I'm doing is a service, whether they define it that way or not, because a service isn't just doing what you want or what you like. Sometimes being of service is also being challenging. And my nature is to evolve people and to evolve things, to move. Remember I said I grew up in Africa and it's about how do you better people? Um, so does that give you an idea? It does, but building on that a little bit, if you are seen as challenging or even scary, do you see that as a badge of honor? Not necessarily a badge of honor. I don't particularly like being projected on. And I do get a lot of projections, particularly by some people who do not like the fact that I'm, when I say something, I'm, I'm, I'm right. Um, can I give an example? Of course. Uh, which one? Southwest Leather. Master Steve's legacy was to develop a community there of MS kinky folk that are deeply spiritual. And he was the second um, person to start a regional event in terms of the Master Slave contests in support of the title to bring about awareness in our community about MS and MS dynamics. Several years after he resigned, the, con the contest was relegated to a one-hour event on Saturday afternoon. Believe me, Butchman's got a letter, a very rationally written letter, reminding them about what their legacy was and questioning why they were allowing this to happen and that it was okay if they wanted to change their minds 
but please don't disrespect the title. Now, I didn't get a response to that email. I know personally that people were shocked that I would say that, but the next year the title was back in its rightful slot. And I know that I ruffled feathers. Fantastic. And, you know, if I have a reputation for doing things like that, that's fine. But there are people that don't like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, more recently I've had tussles with Mast International, mm -hmm. having been the person that established the Mast brand in Australia and New Zealand and the UK. There, I have a lot of um, respect for Mast, for what Master Kepler did, and the idea of building community in local groups so that people support one another. But I have very little respect. I'm very critical of Mast International, which I see as a separate entity that basically does nothing. And not only that, but is very destructive in its arrogance in think, thinking that they know what other cultures are about. Right. And intervening in other cultures and other countries with that kind of, dare I say, American arrogance that really creates more shit. Pardon my French. <laughs> and when I challenged them on that, they decided in the end that I'm too arrogant, that I can't work with people, and they sacked me. Incredible. I have no problem with that, but it is, it is a deep sadness on my part that people who are entrusted with community building are actually just destructive. And not only destructive, but are just playing at that. To me, that is an injustice to us as a community. Fascinating. Going a slightly different direction, <clears throat> please tell us about your healing workshops. I know you wanted me to talk about this. Yes. If it's all right. This is another part of my life. Again, it's related to service. Um, I see healing as inextricably intertwined with spirituality. My background and my training is in clinical psychology, cognitive behavioral clinical psychology, and I'm a lapsed clinical psychologist. Because it lacks spirit. It lacks an understanding of psyche as spiritual. So I, I've had a life journey of trying to understand what is spirituality, what is true healing. And um, I trained as a Wiccan. I'm a self-defined um, Hindu. Um, my guru is the late Sai Baba, Satya Sai Baba. I've studied Buddhism. I've practiced um, multiple different religions, Islam, Christianity, way back to Rosicrucians. Um, I am a six-level Reiki healer in the seven-level Reiki system. I have a deep fascination uh, for healing arts. I believe whether one knows this for sure or not, that in a past life I was a healer because of my affinity for um, particularly energetic healing. I'm a pranic healer, but I'm a certified pranic healer. I'm sorry, I'm unfamiliar with that. What is that? Prana is uh, chi, energy, and pranic healing combines uh, practice um, developed by Master Choa Kok Sui, who is a Filipino Chinese who recently passed, um, in being able to work with chakras, 
and with energy fields. And it is similar to Reiki, but doesn't require hands-on. Okay. Um, so, I don't promote what I do as a healer, but people come to me when they know. And when people come to me, I feel a karmic obligation, a karmic duty to work with them. So all of my healing work, my uh, healing workshops have been a result of a sense of duty to people. Because again, linked to what is my, my being in the world to be of service. If I have this skill and this ability, it is my obligation to provide it, but not insert it, but to provide it. Free of charge as an act of love to promote the evolution of, of people and the removal of suffering. Utterly fascinating. Oh, Doug. <laughs> no, it's true. I, I know one person who's benefited from your healing workshops and she speaks incredibly highly of you. I think I know who you mean. <laughs> and, you know, it, I don't do it for thanks. Mm. I do it because it's a calling. Mm. And it does take a lot of energy out of you, but it is a calling and it is a duty. What would you say has been your greatest challenge in that? In healing? Yes. It took me many, many years to develop a direct line. What I mean by that is to shift the ego out of the way and to truly, truly be centered in myself, to simply be a vessel and a channel for what is a universal healing energy to come through. That takes a lot of dedication and a lot of work. So when I'm asked to do healing, I spend a lot of time doing self-purification. Because I'm very conscious that our mind and our ego is not what's required in pulling through that energy for others. That's a whole other workshop interviews me. <laughs> it's a lifetime. But when you say when you're when you're called to do a workshop, do people ask you on behalf of someone else or does someone directly ask you to do it for them? Both. Both both have happened. Um, when people found out what it is that I'm capable of doing, like say Robert, who invited me to Southwest Leather. Um, people would invite me on behalf of others to talk about this or do this and so on and so forth. Um, as I said, I don't advertise it because I don't think that um, that kind of healing is, it's not egoic. But surprisingly people come up out of the woodwork just recently, last week, I had a young woman approach me and ask me to, to do some work with her. I can't say no, because something put her there. I don't know why, but clearly, something brought her in my path. And that's the piece of the path we walk together. Amazing. Simply fascinating. You've said that many powerful slaves aren't afforded community recognition. Why is that? Well, I think, I think things are slowly changing there. I think things are evolving. I mean, we're having this interview. Um, which is not a personal egoic honor. It, it, it is an... It is about recognizing all slaves. I as a representative of them. Um, 
I have been invited to um, give keynote addresses, for example, at various events. But by and large, by and large, I think there is a problem in general with slaves. And I think there's several reasons for that. And I think the first one, um, we have a, a deep shadow. And I use the term shadow from a Jungian perspective. Um, that is that which we don't want to own. We, we suppress, we disown, we don't like. And I think our shadow as a master slave community is we are master centric. Why is that a shadow? Because blindly, quite blindly, without really any empirical evidence, we assume that if you put a capital M in front of your name, that you automatically become knowledgeable. That's true. Or wise. Or capable. And, you know, there's endless workshops about how to improve on that, but we do have a shadow where we automatically assume that these are the people that you put into, into situations of power or leadership. Oftentimes it's the slave behind the master who is the driver, the brains, the intelligence, the doer, the functioner, and the master shows up. God bless Master Steve, now cousin who used to jokingly, but I think with a very serious intent, because he, he was a, he's a Buddhist and he used humor as a means of getting across serious messages. He used to say, God bless the slaves, they rule the world. And I think there's a truth in that. But we don't recognize that. I think there's another aspect, and I think that we delude ourselves in thinking we have community. And by community, what I mean is, a community is a group of people that share not only interests, but a shared vision and shared goals. We don't. We don't. We're a fragmented bunch of people who share a common interest in kinks or a lifestyle, but we do not share goals or visions, and we don't work towards building those. The gay community does. The kinky community, I'm not so sure. I don't think so. Master slave community, I don't think so. And if we were more inclined to be building community in that way, I think we would be more inclined to be giving recognition where recognition is due. Whereas now, slaves are just appendages of masters. And masters recognize them, but nobody else is supposed to. Because what are they contributing other than to their masters? That's a very individualistic construct of, you know, I think unique to Americans as well. But it stops us from actually seeing through and seeing into uh, people and reimagining how masters and slaves can be together. So I think those issues um, get in the way of people actually manifesting really a sense of honor and recognition towards slaves in a real way. And I think there is a, what, let's call it, for want of a better word, like slavism. Now, I know I've been controversial there, yeah. you know, the straight and blunt, say it as it is. I'm sure many people will disagree, but there you go. Given your slave experience, what advice can you offer other people coming into the scene? Given the kinds of problems slaves have, and attaching themselves to the, you know, 
when you've been living with a kinky sense for decades and decades, and you decide to take the leap and go for it, a lot of slaves latch on to the first so-called bastard that comes along. That's true. So the advice I would give is, take your time. Take your time. Take your time. Don't rush into relationships. And be discerning. At Master Slave Conference next week, I'm giving a workshop called The Power of No. Mm -hmm. Say no. I wish I could be there for that. Oh, darling. <laughs> wow. The power of no. It's a taboo. Absolutely. Breaking new taboos. <laughs> I have to say, I am absolutely fascinated with um, the PhD upon which you are working, um, depth psychology. Would you please explain that for everyone? <laughs> I'm sure that uh, depth psychology can be explained in like a few key words, but I'll try. Um, this is looking at the hidden um, what's beneath, um, what's not obvious, the unconscious drivers around what motivates people's behavior, whether that's individual behavior, um, relationships, or societies. And um, one of the offshoots of depth psychology is liberation psychology, which is looking at the underlying issues of oppression and repression in uh, societies. I would love to read it when it's finished, if you'd be willing to share it. I'd love to read your thesis. My thesis, really? Yeah, I would. Well, okay. <laughs> I think there's a, there's a certain level of masochism in you. No. Nobody reads people's PhDs. Well, as I've said, I, I find your topic so absolutely fascinating that I absolutely would love to read what you have to say. Thank you, Doug. I think you're one of my groupies. <laughs> What's the biggest misconception about you? <laughs> um, in other people? From other people? Yeah, sure. About me as Slave Caroline? Yes. Several years ago, I, I thought most people see Slave Caroline as this really kind of uh, thoughtful, serious um, person. Solid. I don't think most people see me as funny. So a couple of years ago, when Master Taino asked me to do a keynote address, I thought, okay, mm. I'm gonna talk about the philosophy of shit. Yes. <laughs> and <laughs> I have a very good sense of humor. I just don't let it out very often. I think, I am a serious kind of person, you know, when you're doing shit like PhDs, you are. Yes. But most people are quite surprised and shocked that I also have, uh, you know, a humorous side to me. So that keynote kind of like dispelled that misconstruction. <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I now have a reputation to uphold, so I don't know what, whatever it is since then. I'm not sure, but I'd say that they don't think of me as funny. We'll sleep. Don't ask me to tell jokes. <laughs> See? I would like to thank you for an amazing interview this morning, and I wish you a very, very enjoyable GLLA. You're most welcome, and thank you for inviting me. This has been fun.